Good afternoon. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Business Housing Zoning Committee for February 27, 2024. I'm Jamal Osman, and I'm the chair of this committee. At this time, I'll ask city clerks to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for, the, for this meeting. Council Member Rainville. Present. Cashman. Present. Jenkins. Present. Chowdhury. Present. Vice Chair Ellison. Here. Chair Osmond. Here. There are six members present. Let the, re let the record reflect we have a quorum. On the agenda for today's meetings before us, we have nine items on the consent agenda. The first two items is liquor license approval. The second item is 14 liquor license renewal. The third item is thir three gambling license approvals. The fourth item is amending the 2024 license fee schedule. Yes, thank you. The fourth item is amending the 2024 license fee schedule related to the maximum fees for class A motor vehicle services. The fifth item is environmental covenant for 2704-29 Avenue South. The sixth item is approving HCHRA assistance for three affordable housing projects. The seventh item is comprehensive plan amendment for 1315 and a half University Avenue Southeast. Item eight is scheduling for a public hearing for housing revenue bond for 550 West Lake Street. The last item is referring to a staff amended introduction for ordinance related to the liquor and beer. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda or are there any items that anyone would like to pull for further discussion? Councilman Marineville. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do have a question on item six on the consent. So the tow truck service fees, is this a reduction in the fees or uh, are we holding to the staff's recommendation? What are we gonna do with the fees? I will have a uh, council, um, uh, the staff to answer that question. Mm -hmm. uh, Chair Osmond and uh, council member Rainville, I'll have our licensing and consumer services manager, Amy Lingo, answer that question. Thank you, Chair Osmond. Um, this is the annual adjustment based off of the federal um, uh, PCE exchange, and it is an inflationary increase based off of those numbers. The uh, increase would be for the uh, daily storage, changing from $36 a day to $37 a day, and it would be changing the uh, maximum allowed towing rate to, I believe it was like a $6 increase, and it is a yearly inflationary increase study based off of federal numbers. Thank you, Director, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member Rainville. Is there any other question? Seeing none, I'll approve the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it, and the motion carries. I also would like to recognize we have been joined by Council Member Robin Wansley and Council Vice President uh, Aisha Chuktai. On our next item is a public hearing on the ordinance to amend previous provision to establish a minimum uh, driver compensation for TNC companies. We have a number of people sign up to speak on this matter. I would like to explain the process. We will first have a presentation from the staff and then we will open the floor for a public comment. If you would like to speak and have not signed up yet, please see the clerk to sign up. I will call on speakers in order that they are signed up and each person will have up to two minutes. After everyone has spoken, we will close the public hearing and have a discussion, then vote on the ordinance. After the vote, we will take 10 minutes recess to allow everyone to exit the chambers before we resume our business. And now I will ask our staff, Amy Lingo, to give us presentation. 
Good afternoon, Chair Osmond and committee members. I'm Amy Lingo, Manager for Licenses and Consumer Services, presenting an ordinance amendment relating to Title 13, Chapter 343, Transportation Network Companies. The goal of this proposed ordinance is to establish a minimum wage equivalent to increase income and economic stability for the entire TNC driver workforce. The ordinance that is before you today is addressing the minimum wage compensation for transportation network company drivers. On January 30th of this year, Andrew Hawkins from the Policy and Research Division of the Office of the City Auditor presented a compensation rate model analysis study. Three models were studied. Model A, minimum compensation rate of 140 per mile and 51 cents per minute for the time during transportation of a rider. Model B, a minimum compensation rate of 117 per mile and 34 cents per minute for the time during transportation of a rider. Model C, a flat rate of $24 per hour applied only during time on the way to pick up a rider or during the time of transportation of a rider. Upon receipt of the study, the authors of this amendment have chosen to pursue Model A as the compensation plan. Oops. The policy compensation plan breaks down as thus, $1.40 per mile and 51 cents per minute while in active transport of a passenger. So not on the way to pick up, not on an after drop off, but while a passenger is in vehicle. If the vehicle is an approved wheelchair accessible vehicle, the rate to be paid is $1.81 per mile, 51 cents per minute while in active transport of said passenger. There is a $5 minimum. This is not the base fare. This is the minimum of how much the driver will receive. 80% of any canceled rides fees will go to the driver. There are tip protections, and tips are not to be counted towards the compensation plan and are to be processed separately. No deductions without consent of the driver, nor for TNC profit. The drivers are required to receive compensation within a reasonable time frame, which is no greater than seven days. Minimum compensation due for this is due for the portion of the ride that occurs only within the city of Minneapolis. That concludes my presentation. I'll stand for any comments or questions you may have. Thank you so much. We'll have the question at the end. But now, thank you for your presentation. Now I'm going to proceed to open the public hearing. Uh, we have a number of people that sign up. We have people that are on the overflow room. I will call first three names. Um, so you are you know you would know that your name will be next. First three names is the first person to speak is Farhan Badel. Next person is Shafi Sugo and Jessica Myers. Farhan Badel. You have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Members. Uh, my name is Farhan Badel. I'm a father of three. Uh, I'm the sole provider of my family. I've been driving for five years. Um, thank you for not forgetting about us, not giving up on us, as we're here today just asking for fair compensation, you know? Uh, it's been really hard the last couple of years as inflation has gone up, the cost of living has gone up, our rates have decreased. Uh, according to the data from the Department of Labor here in the state of Minnesota, in 2022, Uber and Lyft drivers completed over 11 million trips in Hennepin County. The uh, city of Minneapolis is the most populous city in Hennepin County. Uh, it doesn't take a genius to know that most of those rides were completed here. A ride from downtown Minneapolis to St. Cloud pays 45 to 50 bucks. Just look around you. Uber and Lyft see us as cheap labor. That should not be tolerated in the city of Minneapolis. All we're asking is for fair compensation. That's all we're asking for. We're not cheap labor. We're ambassadors of this city. We're ambassadors of convenience, safety, and efficiency. All we're asking for is for the city council members to do what's right. All we're asking for is that we, at the very minimum, we deserve minimum wage or fair wage. That's all we're asking for. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Farhan, for your comments. Next person is Shafi Sugo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jamal. Uh, hello, my name is Shafi Sugo. I'm a parent and a head of a household of five. I'm also the sole breadwinner of my family. 
our source of income comes through my driving profession. I have been driving for TNC in the last four years, and in those four years, I spent six uh, to seven days a week and over 50 hours on the street driving to at least uh, pay our bills. But it's getting harder to accomplish that even when I'm putting more hours day after the other. Because our wages are slashed more than half over the years I was driving for TNC while the cost of living has skyrocketed. Uh, many of us have invested this business with, with uh, all of their savings and are losing every day. Uber and Lyft don't simply pay drivers enough for expenses and bills. And at the moment, at least two things will happen when one work as full-time for Uber and Lyft. You will either be homeless or live in your car in parking lots. We don't want to go to the government for assistance, but we are here to ask you, uh, the great council members of City of Minneapolis, to support this ordinance, uh, which will at least give us a fair pay. Thank you. Thank you, Shafi, for your comments. Next person is Jessica. Greetings. Um, uh, Uber is my primary gig and has been for over a year. Uh, prior to that, I primarily drove Uber Eats and DoorDash. I started driving for Instacart and DoorDash in 2019, and this has been um, this style of gig work has been my primary source of income ever since. Um, I like Uber for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is Uber pays 100% tuition with Arizona State University. Um, this ordinance is much better than previous things I've read that are trying to do the same thing, but there are still a few things I would like to see changed. Um, paid for the distance of pickup, a minimum payment for food and connect delivery such as Uber Eats and DoorDash, and I was wondering why it says or English, not and English. Uh, my biggest problem is not that we get paid while the rider is in the car, what we get paid while the rider is in the car. The problem is the distance we drive to pick them up. Yes, that's true about the St. Cloud being $45, it's atrocious. But um, I had a ride yesterday, it was a total of 28 miles. I was paid 77.5 cents per mile. Uh, but while the rider was in the car, it was $1.16 a mile. Um, and the, the problem with that is the distance to picking up the, the rider. Uh, I used to drive Uber Eats extensively and DoorDash on my bicycle. Um, I stopped doing both because only a minimum fee of $3 for food and $5 delivery for items like a 40-pound bag of dog food or multiple cases of 30 packs of beer um, or an Apple laptop, um, $5 to drive miles to deliver a laptop. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention was and in English, not or English. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica, for your comment. The next three people are Shannon Berry, John Coleman, and Reed Ali. Shannon, you have two minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Henry David Thoreau wrote civil disobedience. People should defy unjust laws in favor of the moral good, which Muhammad, Gandhi, and Martin Luther King supported in our rights for civil, civil movements and justice for the people. The new age of technology and the acts that these big businesses are taking over need to be monitored so that the people don't lose out on just fair pay for their work. Drivers suf suffer raising gas prices, inflation, safety concerns, 
underpayment and overworking. Rising maintenance costs take out a lot of our money and companies on the internet need regulation and our essential drivers holding people together need a voice for fair pay, accountability. We are the face of their $200 billion businesses and the people's major link to every financial success. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Next person is Josh Common. I don't own a car and I'm dependent on mass transit and TNC. The service TNC drivers provide to me is a need. I was disturbed to learn they, are paid minim they aren't paid minimum wage. There are times I'm dependent on TNC drivers and it upsets me to recognize my needs are fueling their exploitation. I chat with drivers about their working conditions and they are paying for gas, car maintenance, and other work expenses. The companies that contract with them are profitable. We know the money is there to pay them more. They deserve more for everything they do to make it possible for me to live without a car. They deserve the basic human dignity of a livable wage and our gratitude. Thank you so much for your comment. Eid Ali. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member, um, Mr. Osman. Uh, it's a great opportunity to just come in front of you. Um, as you're well aware of, we have been uh, in a journey for the last two years where we wanted to get a fair compensation um, for those wonderful drivers who are out there every day. I would say seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day. Um, they're not asking for handouts. They're fighting just for fair compensation. This great city of Minneapolis is known to be on the side of the workers. And I believe that if we wanted to be on the right side, as we were before on this issue, we are requesting all of you to support this. Me, also, as the head of Minnesota Uber and Lyft Drivers Association, who has been in this struggle for quite some time. I am a dad. I'm a parent of five kids. Um, I'm not asking anything more than what I should get. I believe in working and working hard, and that's what I have been doing. But what's missing in this equation is fairness, because when I work hard, I deserve to get something that I deserve. I deserve to get what I should uh, work for. So it has been really struggle, and it's still getting even worse. So we're asking again, the great council members of city of Minneapolis to look at the faces of those people. They're not trying to get assistance from the government. They want to work, and they want to earn for their own families, and I guess there's nothing wrong with that. Again, these drivers are getting paid less than half of what they were getting paid 10 years ago. They're not even asking to get a, 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 a raise. They're asking at least to come back a level close to where it was 10 years ago. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eight, for your comment. Uh, next three people are Nat or Matt Froiland, Mohammed Egal, and Shoaib Mohammed. If you need a translator, or if you feel comfortable speaking your language, please let us know, we will, we will have a translator for you. Or um, someone, one of your friends can translate for you. Thank you, council members. I'm a resident of Ward 5 and a frequent Uber and Lyft passenger. I ask that you support Model A to guarantee that drivers make the city's minimum wage. If I buy groceries or lunch or a cup of coffee in Minneapolis, I know that the employees of that business are being paid minimum wage. 
there's no reason the same shouldn't be true when I get an Uber or a Lyft. If small businesses here in Minneapolis can do it, so can billion dollar companies. City policy should be designed not for those billion dollar Silicon Valley tech companies, but for the workers who live here, shop here, and build communities here. Do not let Uber and Lyft scare you away from ensuring a minimum wage for all. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Next person is Mohammed Egal. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mohammed Egal, uh, president of uh, Mulder Members Association. Um, this is a great opportunity uh, to have uh, this opportunity in front of the city council members. Uh, here today are a number of uh, driver advocate groups, I think maybe three of them, and they all in agreement with what you're doing. And uh, I think I'm glad that city council members, as I heard from uh, city council member Jamal, you already hired your staff to study this case and to know the truth of the matter. And now I think you already realize what is going on. And we told you a number of times, we've been before you before, before now, we explained to you what's happening and what's taking place in uh, ride share uh, companies. And we tell you repeatedly that drivers are getting half of what they deserve, half of what they deserve. Almost what they're getting is just their expense. They're not getting no profit. They're not benefiting anything. All they get is just the expense. And I'm telling you, and I can assure you, if any driver who is here today his car or her car broke down, they won't be able to fix it. But instead of fixing it from the money they made from over, they will be fixing it using credit cards. I swear, God, I'm not lying. It. Nobody can fix their cars. They cannot do it. They don't make money. They just make their expense. They may pay their bills. They may, you know, you know uh, use, uh, have some cash or whatever it is, but they won't be able to fix their cars. And the expense, also, I think I reached time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comment. Uh, next person is Raib Mohammed. Uh, my name is Shuey Mohammed. I'm from uh, Minnesota Rideshare Drivers Association. I'm a public relations uh, officer. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity today. Uh, uh, our organization had an agreement with uh, Huber uh, last almost a year ago with $1.17 per mile and $0.34 cent per minute. On that time, everybody was wondering and was a little bit weird, but that was the minimum that we can uh, work in this city or uh, in the state of Minnesota. Currently, uh, as you know, the bill was uh, vetoed by the governor of this state, and still we're struggling to get a bill that is uh, actually possible for the public of Minnesota, livable weight for the driver, and also uh, something that makes sense for the election officials that they are doing favor for their all employee, the Uber drivers, Lyft, and also for the public that they are presenting. So. At the moment, still, we're sticking with our agreement with Uber at $1.17. And, but the most of the places, uh, there was a task force uh, appointed by the governor, and then there was a proposal, probably $1.35 a minute. So we are, we are supporting where the most of the public and the driver's interest is. Where the public interest is, it's almost $1.30 around there, or $0.35 cent a minute. So that's why we are supporting. We don't want a bill that the uh, governor was featured and here in Council uh, of Minneapolis uh, proposing that something more than what the uh, governor already vetoed. So we don't want to renounce our reputation. We are, we are all family members. We need to work and we're working for the city as you just sitting here. We are the people who elected you and then what we needed is something that make ourselves a livable way uh, and also 
good for the drivers and good for the public. We don't want to uh, always come to a meeting and hearings that are not fruitful. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much for your comment. Uh, next three people I will be calling is Mohammed Mursal, Ahmed Ahmed, and Matthew McGlory. McGlory. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mohammed Mursal, you have two minutes. Hi, good afternoon. So I'm coming, my, uh, I'm driving Lyft and Uber. All is closed without reason. One is five years, one is one year. That's why I'm coming. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Um, next person is Ahmed Ahmed. Thank you, Mr. Osman, and thank you to city members. I don't know if you can see this well. I have something to share with you. I can't see really. Yeah. So as you know, Lyft announced three weeks ago that they're going to give drivers Here we go. As you see there, as you see there, Lyft announced two weeks ago that they're going to give drivers 70% of what the customer pays. And we have been fighting all for a year to get our fair share of what the customer pays. I'm going to show you what they come up. They come up in order to cover the 70% that the Lyft takes from us. They come up with this solution three weeks ago. Look, this customer, do you see this? $54, that's what customer pays. And they come up with EST external fees, $4. We don't know what that is for. It's new to us. And they come up there, $4 there, and they come up EST lift fees, $28.44. That's lift fees. To put together four dollar plus twenty-eight, they took thirty-two dollars, thirty-three dollars out of fifty-four. That's what the lift took it, and they give us twenty dollars and nine cents out of out of a fifty-four dollar. So I'm here to support Model A. What you are doing right. I support you and I rely on you. You're going to do the right decision. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for your comment. Uh, Matthew? Good afternoon. My name is Matthew McGlory, North Minneapolis resident. Um, I've been driving Lyft and Uber for seven years. I've done over 10,000 Lyft rides, over eight, almost 9,000 Uber rides. Um, hold on. Um, February. 27th at 4:14. Uh, can you all see this? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yep. So that's one. I'm gonna just go through my last three airport rides. That was at 4:15. Uh, this one was at uh, hold on 450, 4:59. Uh, customer paid 42.89. I'm gonna show you my last one. This one was at 10. So what I want to talk to you about is the elephant in the room. Um, and in the land of 10,000 fakes, we know what's going on with rideshare. And so what do we need to do to cut through the apathy? What do we need to do to cut through the apathy? Because you, you can't sit up and say that we don't know what's going on with Lyft and Uber drivers. Lyft and Uber uh, councils is the largest 
non-employer employer in your city. And what I mean by that is that we're not W-2 employees. We're independent contractors. You might have 25 or 30,000 Lyft or Uber drivers, albeit we don't all drive full-time. Um, some of us have a full-time schedule. A portion of us have a part-time schedule. But you all know the data is empirical, and you all know this. You all know this. You all know that Uber and Lyft are finessing us and they're finding creative strategic ways to take money out of our pockets. And we drive. We drive when there's six inches of snow out. We drive when we have to take a customer to, customer to Mayo or to Rochester. We drive when we have to take a customer to Duluth. So we need the city of Minneapolis to stand up for us. And thank you for everyone that came, because I see some city council people that aren't even here. Thank you so much for coming and hearing us out. Thank you so much, Matthew. Uh, next person, next three people are uh, Adil uh, and Mustafa Abdullah and Maryam Brown. Maryam Brown. I am Adil, father of five uh, kids. Four girls and one boy, okay? I'm gonna show you one example of Uber request. Uh, Uber, over here, is UberX. They provide us up front is $64.32, and driving hour is one hour 46 minutes. That's mean 91 no. mile, okay? We can't, we can't see the whole thing. Can you put it in the middle? There we go. You see Thank it? you. Yes. $64.32. Two dollar for ninety one mile. That's mean one hour forty six minute driving. That's mean thirty people they think it's thirty six dollar hour. It's not thirty six hour hour. It's two dollar point seventy five dollar hour. You know, if we co the cost if you want to operate any vehicle in Minnesota according to IRS, you need zero point sixty seven mile. Or hour, no, zero sixty-seven cents a mile to operate any vehicle, business vehicle, doesn't matter. Like, look, left Uber, taxi, you need that. Look here, we get only two dollar point seventy-five cents an hour. That's not fair. Our wages go lower, 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 lower. You know. Now we come to you guys, all of you, to help us. You know, we we trust you guys. We trust you a lot, 100%. We trust all the members of Minneapolis to help us. We are in bad situation now. You know, we can pay our food, we can pay our rent, we can make payment, house payment. What are we gonna do? Our house they gonna go for closer. The bank they gonna take our houses. Who gonna who gonna pay for that? Nobody gonna Uber left. They don't pay for that. They don't care about us. They don't care. They, they care about you making money behalf of us. T to make us, as many money, to need to make money. We don't think about us to make money. Before, I've been driving with Uber and lived almost like nine or 10 years, you know? Uh, your minutes are, okay. Robert, if you can ride route. Thank you so much. Um, next person is Mustafa Abdullah. Uh, Senator Amr Fattah. You can call me Mustafa also. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for giving me the time. Uh, my name is uh, Omar Fateh. I'm the state senator representing uh, District 62 in South Minneapolis. Um, I remember two years ago now, I think it was May or June 2022, um, I got a call from MOLDA, the Minnesota Uber Lyft Drivers Association, and Council Member Jamal Osman got the same call. They wanted to uh, meet with a group of us legislators, state and local legislators, about some of the issues that they're facing as drivers. And I was expecting a smaller meeting, maybe a dozen or so people. So when we came, there were several hundred drivers that came to talk about what was going on, talking about the abuse, talking about the activations, talking about uh, um, the, 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 the massive amount of profits and revenue that Uber is making while their, uh, their, their wages have stagnated or even gone down year after year. So taking that back, um, myself uh, and the legislators and city council members, we made a commitment to the drivers that we would do something about this. Uh, and we took it back. Uh, we started working. 
um, and we were able to pass something at the state legislature last year. Uh, unfortunately, it was vetoed, um, but we look at you to say that we're working in partnership. This bill here is not in any way going against what's work, what we're working on to bring back at the state this year. We're working in partnership, and I'm really honored. I'm proud to see the work that you've put in and uh, what's coming up for the, I believe, $1.40 and 52 cents, uh, because Uber has been making billions and billions of dollars every quarter billions, every month billions, and they're making those, the, that amount of money off of the backs of the workers, stealing from their wages. Um, and these folks are not just fighting, they're fighting to put food on the table, fighting for their families. Um, and we've heard all of the stories uh, about how they've been struggling. And these are folks that we rely on. We rely on them on the weekends, we rely on them to go to our appointments, we rely on them to get to work. So I think it's only fair that uh, they get their fair share and er that they earn a livable wage. Um, and we have a saying at the state capitol, when the federal government gets it wrong, then it's up to us to make it right. But now, when the state gets it wrong, we're looking to you to get it right. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your comments, Senator Fatah. Next person is Mariana Brown. Hi, everyone. I'm just here to say a few things, because basically what's going on uh, with, with Uber and Lyft? We as a people should stand up for one another in this state. Minnesota is a state that have no law to protect the drivers. Other states have, but Minnesota don't have. So we're asking you to pass a bill, whatever needs to be done for these drivers, because we're suffering out there. Gas price is going up. We get, the state, we get less than we were making. Gas price go down, we get less and it's going down each time. Each time you get a trip, it's sometimes you don't even want to take the trip, and we're sorry, and most passengers will complain, but if you have to drive 30 miles to pick up someone to make $5, if you do the math, it's not worth it. So something needs to be done. In New York, you get, pick, um, you get paid from you get the, the, the trip, to, to when you drop off. You get paid per minute, per mile. And I could speak for New York, because I work in New York for Uber for almost six years. There's law and regulation there. So we're asking for the same law for you guys to stand up with us and show that you support us, because we need you to stand in solidarity. Because the big corporation is taking advantage, and they're killing the little people. So we don't want to go and live off public assistance and food stamps and medical. We want to do that for ourselves. I, myself, I work sometimes 70 hours a week, 72 hours a week. I'm out there working, and we're scared for our life at certain times at night. We're scared because we don't know who we're picking up. People come with names, daddy love mommy, mommy love daddy. These are not names that you should be picking up because if something go wrong, they're going to say daddy love mommy. Who are they? We need to, for them to stand up and be accountable for us as driver that we could move forward and stand in solidarity. Minimum wage, people that work in McDonald's and Burger King, they could say, I take home $300 a week. We can't say that because we don't know how much we take in and we work putting more hours in. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Uh, next three people I will call is uh, Eid Yusuf Haji. Abdirashaf uh, Mohammed. No, uh, I guess Ida have already spoken. Um, Yusuf Haji, Abdirashaf Mohammed, and Jamal Hassan. Yusuf? Hello, everyone. My name is Yusuf Haji, and I'm here as a spokesman for Mulder members. As you can see, there is a couple of groups that are representing rideshare drivers in this state of Minnesota. And, and so we're here today, today collectively speaking with one voice on that we need something done. And what needs to be done and, and why it should be done is, is simple. Um, equity and inclusion, we always say, uh, on level of government, we always say we want equity and inclusion. This is, this is now the ball is in your court. Uh, the other thing we always talk about is ec economic empowerment. Most of these drivers, majority are from the Latino community, from the African community, from South America, from Africa, from Europe, some parts of Europe. Not all of them are rich, by the way. Um, so 
they do this. Some part-time, some, uh, some full-time, but some, a lot of them depend on these jobs to support their families. So if we want to really have a, a fair distribution, because if, when, if they get more, that means what? Our local businesses are going to do better. Our local restaurants are going to do better because that's where they eat, that's where they shop, that's where they go and do what they need to do. So that money goes to our communities. It goes to our schools. It goes to our learning uh, madrasas, you know what we call uh, for the Muslim community. So when they get better, the parents here and there and everywhere who are ride share drivers get to take their schools, uh, their kids to, to these uh, uh, small after school learning programs. So this is what we're talking about when we say we're serious about this. And we're also talking about addressing disparity. I ought to be quick. I only got 12 seconds. I don't know if I'm going to finish it, but and community investments. So we're here to support. We're all here together. Just remember that all different rights share drivers groups are here supporting this bill. Thank you very much, City Council. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Yusuf, for your comment. Abdul Rashaf, Mohammed. Hi everyone. Um, I want to. I don't. I don't want to take long. Uh, but I want to say these two companies. I call them high tech robbery. And uh, as as you can see here, that's Clark fifty Keisha. dollars. Sorry. A um, couple of weeks ago there was a snow, as you know. So during the snow, driving is very hard. Roads are very rough. Safety, you know, is is very you know, very hard too. So I use my own driver app to check how much they charge in the ride, rider. And this is what I saw. From downtown to the airport, UberX was $93. Hmm. And guess what? That's how much they were offering me the same night, $11.49, driving 18 miles, picking up a passenger and drop him off to the airport. So you can see the gap. Oh, sorry. You can see the gap. So that means, you know, these guys are robbing us. And it's you guys who can stop them. So please help us to stop these guys. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Uh, Jamal Hassan. Good afternoon, uh, council members. Good afternoon, everybody else. Uh, my name is Jamal Hassan. I am with Marda, Minnesota Rideshare Driver Association. And uh, we all know that the drivers, wherever they are from, whoever they are, they're struggling. And we have, there's no question about it. And we know that last year, uh, there was two bills that are being passed by either both city of Minneapolis and the state, and they both rejected. And we don't want to be the same way. We don't want to keep going back and forth. We want to make sure that these drivers, we heard their struggles, we live by them, we work with them, we see them every day. We want to make sure that something is, is done for them. And for example, uh, Washington, uh, Seattle, Seattle, uh, Seattle, city of Seattle passed a bill for the drivers, I believe is a dollar forty. And then what happened to the drivers? They lost 50, uh, over 30 percent of the rights that they were doing. So we don't want to hurt the drivers. We don't want to hurt anybody. We want something that the drivers can make uh, a living. So if we say we can pass $1.80, that's not going to help the drivers. What's going to help the drivers is something that they can make more than what they're making right now and that they can live by it and that the passengers can also pay. So we don't want drivers sitting down uh, getting nothing. So we will we'll help. I mean, your efforts will pay for it. And then the state will also do something. So we'd like that to be combined and both the state and the city to come up with the same bill that can pass and that can help the drivers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your comment. We have about 10 more people here, but if you have not signed up, please see the city clerk to sign up. Next three people are Suleiman Ahmed, Murid Amani, and Stephen Cooper. Suleiman, you have two minutes. Thank you, Council uh, Chairman. Uh, Councilman Jalman Osman and the rest of the councillors. My name is Suleiman Ahmed. Uh, thanks, Mr. Eid, invite me from St. Paul today. And I used to be a 
Uber driver. I did drive long time ago, but I'm no longer driving now. And the reason that's why I'm going to share today, but as what these people are sharing, all the story that they're showing on their mob mobiles. And also, I want to share what people not yet share. So this is new. This is, for example, uh, what had happened to me, and I'm no longer, I want to not drive for Uber, drive, uh, Uber and uh, what you call uh, Lyft. Uh, I have a car, which is eight seat. Then I have, I'm a married man, four children. I'm paying rent for four, uh, 2000 I have a lot of other costs. Then I took my car and I register Uber and uh, Lyft in order to drive. So I was broke. I was not having money. Then I got to the next door. Friend of mine, I, I borrowed $50 just to put gas so that I can work all that day. And then I give, pay him back when I work it. So all that day from 7 in the morning to 8 p.m. evening, I was been driving and I earned only $50. Sorry, $49. What I borrowed was $50. So I was still not covered at $1 shop. So I pay a lot of gas. The people, what they not share is that I'm driving. I'm the driver. I'm the car owner. I'm t expending my time, my gas. I'm also having stress. But Uber, they only put the uh, platform there. But as, as you see the funds that people are sharing, you get not only half of it, you get, you get less than half. Is that fair? All these people have blessed me. You are, you are con we are constituents. You are our representing people. So please think about this. This is a rig. This is a bad system. And they cannot defend or we can't defend. For me, I'm no longer working. Sorry. I'm no longer working for them. I quit it because I don't want to be abused. And this is what they're facing. These are the constituents really struggling because they are rent payer. And today we are, here, uh, we are here just to share this painful story and struggling story. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next person is Murid Amani. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, my name is Murid Amini. I grew up in Cedar Riverside, and I still work there today as a PCA for my father. I also work in downtown Minneapolis. I am a former Uber driver. I stopped driving because financially it didn't make sense, and I have plenty of family members who are former Uber and Lyft drivers. I am here specifically to address the threat that these incumbent TNC companies will pull out of the city and stop operations if we pass an ordinance that creates fair wages for drivers. I want to share something with you. That's the financial performance of Uber. As you can see, their profitability has gone up over 100% in the last year. Clearly they can afford to take a cut on some of the pay that they make off of drivers' hard work. That's why today I, am, I have the pleasure of introducing PickUp. I'm a co-founder of a locally based TNC company that pledges to give fair, equitable uh, wages to TNC drivers. Thank you. And we have the flexibility and agility to meet any ordinance that the city creates, and we'll create a model that is both fair to the drivers as well as the riders. We have a low cost model, and we invite these other TNC companies to leave the city. We're going to be ready in the next couple of weeks to start operations, and we're ready to take your rides. Feel free to connect with me afterwards. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Uh, please, no, no claps. Uh, next person is Stephen Cooper. Good afternoon, chairman and members. Thank you very much for all the work you've done. And one of the very important things to remember is you've done the work. You've looked at the facts, you've separated fiction from truth, and you know what the fair minimum wage is. That's the important first step. You've done it and you put it in this bill and you did it twice. You did it before the veto and you did it after the veto. So that means you start off in a superior position to where you've ever been before. You know the truth. In this particular case, as somebody already mentioned, the IRS says it costs 67 cents a mile to operate a car. That's all paid for by the drivers. There's nothing paid for by the TNCs. About 150 miles a day are what are driven by the drivers. That's $100 a day in cost. And you heard the individual talking about he, he made $49 after he borrowed 50 to work that day. The important thing is to remember a lot of that even before, even after your bill is not compensated. 
It's not compensated because it's driving without a passenger. If you're sitting at the airport in that huge lot for an hour, you get nothing. If you're driving back from Rochester, you get nothing. You've got all kinds of situations where you're putting miles on the car, but you're getting no compensation, and that's tremendously important. The other, thing, the other things to remember here is, as the last speaker just mentioned, the TNCs bring nothing but a software. They bring no equipment. They bring no investments. They bring nothing. It's the workers, the drivers, who make the full investment. $1.40, I want you to remember, is not a living wage. It's a minimum wage. Most of us pay more than a minimum wage. Here we have two businesses, at least, TNC, saying you should support our ability to pay this particular group of people less than minimum wage so we can be more successful. That's absurd. Every single person who's appeared in front of you in the past when minimum wages were imposed gave Oops, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for your comments. Uh, next three people are. I'm sorry if I pronounce your name. Shaysan Thompson, uh, Daoud Kasa, and Omar Up, um, and Abdullah Said. Shaysan. It is important to hold Uber and Lyft to the same standard of at least $15 for drivers, just as we hold any other small business on that, on that proportion to the policy to create a healthy and local economy and close loopholes. Right now, according to a uh, MIT, MIT research, and this is about four years old, the living wage for one person is $22.49. At least give the drivers who work in our city the current existing minimum wage standard and work for more. I support this ordinance to be passed and for the hard work of the drivers in our city. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Next person is Daoud Kasa. Um, right there, sir. Thank you so much uh, for giving me, giving me this two minutes opportunity. Uh, to be honest, to tell you the whole story, uh, two hours is not enough. But in these two minutes, I'm telling you one thing underlining that prevent me from being homeless and a burden for your state, for your city, for your, uh, uh, for a nation as a whole, because Things are go going worse and worse. Do not see me as I'm dressed well. Inside me, that is really, I'm telling you. I don't know what I'm going to pay now for IRS as a W-2 taxpayer. I am nil. I'm empty. Please prevent me. As a city high official, you have the right to do that. You have the right to do that. If somebody asks you what did what, why, why you do this, because to prevent the people, the citizens, the nations from being homeless and a burden to the nation. I don't want to come every month to look for uh, food stamp and something like that. I am a workable person. I can work. I can help myself with a fair payment. That's what I'm asking you. Prevent me from being homeless prevent me from being homeless, a burden for the nation and for the state as a whole. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. Um, next person is Abdullah Said. Abdullah Said. Right. Um, next person is, just says Mohammed on the last name. Is Mohammed here? Oh, 
Oh, are there, if you are on the overflow room, uh, you're welcome to come. We can get back to you if we pass you. So we will be moving to the next person. Uh, Matt or Matt and and okay looks like we have few people on the overflow room I'm gonna repeat the names Abdullah Said just the name Muhammad and Matt last name O Right. Um, we're gonna continue moving. Um, the next person is Ali Aba or Ali Ba. Say your name. Two minutes. Uh, Matt Olander. Um, I am just here as a community member. Um, I don't believe that we should allow Uber and Lyft to push us around on how we are going to set policy in the city. I believe they are bluffing when they say they're going to pull out of the city. I don't see that happening. Um, and even if it did, I don't believe we should be afraid of the task of building community grounded alternatives. I believe the city is more than capable of doing that. Um, and yeah, we should trust the people of our city to lead that. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you are in the overflow room, uh, please feel free to come inside. Uh, if I call your name, sir, um, state your name. Hello, uh, my name is Mohammed Idrus. I'm Uber Lyft driver. Um, I'm here to support what other drivers are saying. Drivers are struggling. They are not earning minimum wage. So we ask the city council members to pass this ordinance. Uh, I just wanted to address a few things that were said here. Some some uh, speakers here that were talking on behalf of the drivers, and they're not really drivers. They are talking about a dollar 17 or dollar 35. And as we know, they are, Uber and Lyft are trying to manipulate the system. They're recruiting other people and, you know, I don't know, maybe they're paying something, I don't know. I can't prove that, but that's something that's real. So put that into consideration. There are those who are opposing the drivers here they don't want anything to be passed and they already spoke and they're you know so we need to be careful with that there are a few of them who are, who are here today in attendance so we ask you uh, to be to be with the with the drivers and support the drivers uh, we are really struggling and they're unable to pay their rent as you said some may be even homeless you know who knows it's just a matter of time if we if you don't you know pass this resolution thank you so much Oh, thank you so much for your comments. Um, we're going to continue moving, but if I skip your name, we'll come back. If I call your name and you haven't showed up yet. Uh, the next person is Saeed Aidid. Zakaria Abdi. Ariana Fieldman. Saeed Aidid, Zakaria Abdi. Ariana Feldman. Say your name, sir. Zachary. Zachary. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me here. I'm glad to be in front of my leaders. And I'm a lifted driver. I want to show you guys some of the things that is happening. Uh, Lyft, Lyft and Uber uh, told the drivers they will pay 75% out of the ride. And if you guys look here, this ride I just picked. Uh, February 27. Uh, you put it in the center yeah. of the screen. So, uh, so I get it down. I think there's blurry in there. This way? 
Oh, yeah. Uh, right there. Yes. So I get paid $6.20, and the, driver, the customer paid $14.73. That's not even half of, it's not 50-50. Sometimes as a Lyft driver, I feel like helping a scammer to scam my own community. And before, I was working at the Holiday Inn Airport by Bloomington, uh, and I was working 90 hours a week, and I will get only 93, 83. So I was always missing hours. And when I told the company that this is what is going on, they told me I'd rather resign or work there, me working double shifts and losing 30 minutes every day, seven days a week. So I wanted my leaders to help us and to get also safety. Lyft send us a background check, but they don't send the customers to a background check. So it's not safe for me to drive Lyft because I don't know if this person is a murderer or a killer, and I have nine kids to feed on that. Thank you. Thank you, Zach Zachariah, for your comments. Our next person is Ariana. Hi there, hello. Um, my name is Ariana Feldman. I'm a Ward 6 resident and a member of this community. Um, I'm here to speak in support of this ordinance. I am a regular uh, user of Uber and Lyft um, rides. I don't drive myself, so I have to rely on this service. Um, because of that, I understand that this is a really crucial service that members of our community are uh, doing to help our city to continue functioning, and they should be compensated uh, adequately for the work that they do. Um, it doesn't surprise me, unfortunately, that companies like Uber and Lyft are threatening to raise prices or to leave the state, um, but I want to urge you to stand with residents and not let these companies hold us hostage like this. Um, as a writer and a resident, um, I would be very, like, I understand that this might come with price increases, and I believe that um, that is a very worthwhile price to pay for um, the members of our community to be compensated justly um, and for all of us to have what we need in our city. Um, yeah, I really want to urge you these companies do not get to continue to exploit our immigrant communities and our communities of color like this. Um, and so I, um, yeah, urge you to stand with residents and support this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, next three people are... Uh, Musa Mohammed, Alexis Collins, and Saadia Aden, or Saida Aden. It's Musa Mohammed here. Alex Collins and Saida. Saida, if you can come forward. Hi all, uh, my name is Sadia, and I'm speaking for United Here Local 17. Local 17 support minimum wage for all workers and are fully in support of minimum wages, wages for Uber and Lyft drivers. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, Musa Mohammed, Alex, or Al Alexis Collins, Hello, I'm Alexis Collins. I am a board member of Setul, a low wage organization. I started on the Pfeiffer 15 when I was 18. I was three months pregnant with my daughter. I was making 725 at the time. I, I marched up and down the street because that wage was not sustainable. The cost of living goes up every day. These companies are multi-million dollar corporations that can pay the $15. When $15 pass, small businesses start giving $15 out with their paid sick days. They make these threats, but in all nationality, if they leave Minneapolis, they're going to lose half of their funding. We have to make it fair for the lift in the lift in Uber drivers to make a living wage to support their family with gas, insurance, and et cetera that they have to put in in their cars. A lot of things happen to lift drivers and Uber drivers while on the job that is not even covered. So with 
helping them wait, helping them pull up the wages will help them take care of their families and cover all the necessary they have to. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. And the uh, last three person here that are listed is Claudia and Harold Batson. Um, overflow room, uh, sir, go ahead. Chair, council members, there's three verses that come to mind as I think about this exploitation of our drivers. First Timothy 8, the love of money is the root of all evil. When Moses got the commandments, he was told, you shall have no other God before me. And Jesus taught us, give us this day our daily bread. The cost of living in Minneapolis, the housing, the child care, the health insurance, the gentrification, people being pushed out of Minneapolis because they can't afford to live here anymore. All that's related to this. The American trump card is, I have to answer to my shareholders. These companies give campaign contributions to our politicians. The voices and concerns of your constituents get drowned out. So you've, you've, you've had a veto over the mayor regarding the Gaza resolution. I urge you to have a veto on this matter and bring justice for these workers so they can find their daily bread. Thank you for your comments. Um, if I call you your name and you have not spoken, please come forward and speak. And if you would like to make a comment or speak, you can also come forward. A last call for anyone who would like to speak. Straight, you have taken your two minutes already. Yeah, you said anyone who wants no, to speak? No, a person who oh, has not who spoken. Speak. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you said that. If you have not spoken. Yeah, I've not spoken, that's right. Yes, come forward if you have not spoken yeah. yet. Have you spoken yet? Uh, my name is uh, Samwene. Thank you for the city council. We ask you today, build our, ba our uh, bus, our bill, because uh, I am father of six kids. I start Uber and Lyft drivers for 2015. When Uber and Lyft is come city Minneapolis is starting good money, and we bill our, we pay our bills. We go in the homeless. Uh, I'm the full-time job for the Uber and Lyft drivers. Uh, last bill, Jacob Fry, he veto our bills. So support us and, and, and buzz our bills, please. And we tell Jacob Fry, sign our bills when the city of Minneapolis, uh, they bust the bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. I realize there are people that are on the overflow room. Um, and there are people that I that have signed up that I have called that have not come forward. Um, but the last call, is anyone here to speak? or to comment who have not spoken already. Right? Um, see you no one else wishing to speak. I will close the public hearing. And are there any questions or discussions from committee members or council members who are guests on this committee? Question is for staff or comments in general. Council Member Allison. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just wanted to thank everyone who came through to give testimony and my colleagues who have been leading on this issue. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, is, it is always, you know, maybe never all that fun to sit for an hour, but when it's the people of Minneapolis coming to tell you what their needs are, and, and as you all have done today, it's well worth the time. So just wanted to come in and, and thank you all for being here. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure if one of my colleagues is eager to make the motion, but I, um, I'll, so I'll hold off for now. Uh, but, uh, but yes, this is this is great work, and I'm excited to support this work. Thank you, Council Member 
Rainville. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm wondering if our staff, if there's any data on the results in Seattle, uh, the impact of raising the wages to the low-income neighborhoods or the dis disabled community, hospitality workers, what happened in Seattle? Uh, through the chair, um, thank you, council member. That's a good question. At this point, we do not have any um, true information from Seattle, just some anecdotal research, but no data points that we can give you at this time. I can, however, reach out to my contacts to see if we have any updated information. So is that because Seattle, it's it's so new, or um, we just haven't tried to get the information before? It's a complicated study, and there's a lot of nuance to the reporting, um, especially when you add in the, the pandemic and the, the changes in the process and the rider behavior. It's not just a black or white kind of data point scenario. But I can see if they have more information for us to okay. be able to present it to later. Thank you. And then when you are asking for more data, someone had mentioned that uh, Uber and Lyft make billions in profit every quarter. I'm just curious how much money they make. So if you could find that out. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions for council members? Uh, council member Cashman. Thank you, uh, Chair Osman. Comment for the drivers who are here. Thank you for taking time out of your day. Um, and thank you for advocating for your community and coming together to collectively bring uh, better working conditions for our city. And I'm especially excited that local companies are willing, entrepreneurs are willing to step up and to become the local business force um, that we need. We do still need rideshare companies, although I'd love to see a future where we have uh, public transit for all, but we're not there yet. Um, if our staff member could come up, I would like to ask a question about enforcement of the the ordinance and um, what that looks like for who will be in charge of enforcing that Uber and Lyft comply with the ordinance. Chair Osman, um, committee member Cashman, thank you for that question. At this time, the license is being administered by my division, so we will be responsible for holding them accountable for any ordinance that they fall under under this chapter. So we would follow our normal enforcement procedures. Okay, can you share a little bit what those enforcement procedures are? So we are complaint driven. So if we receive a complaint of an issue of not receiving the proper payments based off of you know drives through Minneapolis, we would then uh, follow through. We would reach in our contacts for whatever um, TNC that it was, and then we would um, bring them into discussion about what it was in order to be able to get them to correct the error. If they correct the error, then we just move on from there. If they do not correct the error, then we move on towards such manners, such as citations and settlement conferences and conditions. Thank you. Um, Follow-up question for Council Member uh, Ellison. Uh, just curious, um, and if, if you don't have an answer, that's okay, but uh, even without, once the ordinance is in place, even without city intervention, would the drivers have private right of action uh, uh, to compel compliance if they wanted to come together and, and, and uh, move forward with their own private right of action? There is collective bargaining and uh, action in this ordinance as well, and any uh, worker is allowed to address issues with their employer or contractor. A uh, follow-up question for Councilmember Cashman. Thank you. I believe this question is for our city attorney um, or clerks. If the state legislature this year does pass a bill that supersedes this, how would our ordinance relate to the state law? Um, Mr. Chair and Council Members, uh, it would we would have to see um, what direction the state takes. If any, there are a number of options or a number of different types of preemption. They could pass legislation that explicitly allows <clears throat> cities to have their own legislation. They could pass legislation that explicitly preempts any city from having any legislation on this topic, or they could do something um, in the middle. So it would be a matter of kind of examining what, if anything, does come forward and adjusting at that point, although that's something that we do regularly when the state and the city um, both um, regulate different portions or different industries or, or similar in industries and it's something that we'd be able to look at and examine and adjust to. Uh, yeah, thank you. Council Member Jenkins. Thank you um, Chair Osmond and I did put my thing down oh. but you know I, I will I guess to Council Member Cashman's point 
And I heard a number of speakers today state that, you know, they want to they wanna see a, a bill that supports drivers and consumers. And so, and then subsequently stated, we want something that's not going to be vetoed, right? They want to work together with uh, the administration, with the governor, if that's the, the case, to come up with a solution that will be able to be enacted and not under. So I guess my question is, um, do we see this uh, ordinance as being able to be supported by drivers, consumers, et cetera? Are the question directed to the authors? or uh, To the author. I, th I think you're one of the authors. Also. Yes. Yes, I will. Um, also, Council Member Robin is here who can answer that question. I'll pass it to her. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Council Member Jenkins. Um, I think if we're going by, you know, testimony even today, overwhelmingly we heard drivers say they support a minimum compensation. And right now, that is what this ordinance does. It provides a per mile and per minute rate that has been studied um, a number of times that will get us a minimum wage equivalent, which is through Model A. Um, and that is something that, again, drivers have supported. Um, this is something that's reinforced by our own studies. Um, and as other you know, testifiers alluded to, in terms of impacts on consumers, again, council, we don't have any control over pricing models set by TNCs. Um, what folks have, um, you know, poignantly highlighted is they have substantial, and by they, both Uber and Lyft, uh, have substantial profit margins where they could, so, so they choose, to keep both rides affordable for consumers and to pay drivers a minimum wage, which is what they deserve. Um, I think the focus of our work today through this ordinance is making sure that we don't allow loopholes to be exploited by multi-billion dollar companies um, for ordinances that we already have on the books that small businesses are in compliance with. We have dozens, if not hundreds, of businesses across the city that is paying a minimum wage to their employees and their, their workers, and we shouldn't allow an exemption for rideshare drivers. So that is the focus of this ordinance. There is wide support for that. Um, and as our city attorney, Fussy, highlighted, that does not come in conflict with whatever actions they take at the state. Uh, Senator Fate highlighted that in his testimony as an author of the legislation at the state. Um, so there's really no need to um, not move this forward. Um, and I will hope I have support from uh, my colleagues here on biz um, and at full council, the full nine, because concerns around a veto can easily be overridden by nine votes. Um, so that is the work that the co-authors have done for the past year to build that support, to do our due diligence and study this, to work with the drivers who spoke today and feel very confident that the policy before you today reflects the right direction that we need to go towards. The, the entire question was, how do we get to something that doesn't require a veto? I think that's what I heard from some of the testifiers today. If I can try to jump, I think uh, we as a council members do not control the veto. Um, that's the mayor's uh, um, power to exercise. Um, I am just wanted to say that and also I do, I do wanna add my comment, council member. Um, if you don't mind, I am really proud of the drivers who show up today. I'm very proud of you. Uh, we cannot take credit. This, you have came to us, you have organized it, you have come together, and um, you brought us here today. I do wanna thank 
Special thanks to Councilmember Robin Wansley and her office for tirelessly working on this amendment, not giving up when the veto was um, was vetoed last last year. Um, for over a year, our uh, offices have been uh, coming together to create this uh, ordinance. Um, drivers told us that and told us today that uh, their wages are extremely low and unreliable. We are asking minimum wage equivalent. That is just a basic city requirement. We expect any company to abide those law and respect the law. Uh, the drivers you see today are majority immigrant workers and workers of, of color, and um, they no longer can wait. I really want to to add that um, this is a work. The staff has spent money, money times, many months to give us the models, give us the presentation, do the background uh, work. We as drivers, uh, we as uh, council members, I as a council member believe that we have to hold accountable everyone else. Uh, whatever the mayor does, it's his job to do it. But we're using the data, we're listening to the resident we reserve, we, we represent, and we're passing this law. So I'm hoping my colleagues not to be fearful of um, any veto, but listen to the resident, listen to the drivers, do the right thing. And um, I'm hoping that we will get your support today on the committee, and we will get your support on March 7 to pass this law and hold Uber and Lyft and any other TNC companies accountable to pay the minimum wage uh, of city Minneapolis. And now I will call Council Member Chowdhury. Thank you, Chair Osmond. Um, I first want to thank the authors of this ordinance and our city staff for working on this. And I want to thank you, the drivers and the people of Minneapolis that came out today for coming to share your stories. Um, it was very heartbreaking at times to hear what your personal lives are and who you're taking care of and what, what, how you're trying to support yourselves in this moment. And even more glaring to see some of the images that you brought forward of a ride costing $93 and just getting paid uh, $11.49 for that ride and driving 18 miles. That's not right. So I thank you for being here and advocating for yourself, but I also do want to apologize to you that you have to work in these conditions in our city and that we, we uplift you for helping us revitalize our downtown and support our hospitality and bring people for entertainment, all wonderful things, all necessary things, help people travel, add connectivity to our community. But we haven't had the will and the regulation necessary to provide you with the means to feed your families, put a roof over your head, live outside of your car, I've been in I've been, been in Ubers and Lyfts before where I could tell that the person at night was probably living in their car and by day was starting their job. That was very clear and that was in our own city. So I apologize to you for that and it is really clear. If you do a simple search, you can see Uber themselves reports that in the first quarter of 2024, they estimate uh, have an estimate of an earning of 1.26 billion dollars to 1.346 billion dollars so it's clear the profit is happening and our job as local government is to it is to ensure that we have a minimum wage as set by the city of Minneapolis for all of our workers um, our staff took the time and the effort to do the due diligence to determine accurate calculations to fairly compensate drivers based off of what our minimum wage is. And then also consider 
mileage, the wear and tear on a car, cleaning, other costs that might be a, that might incur during a duration of a ride or when you have miles and miles back um, after you've dropped off a rider and accounted for the cost of living in Minneapolis. And they determined this by reviewing data and information and analysis done by two major cities. And they have found that this is the minimum wage. This is the minimum wage here in the city of Minneapolis. So if we are looking to do anything below what we're presenting here in Model A, one thing we need to be clear about is that that is not the minimum wage and that is not up to the standards of what we have set for the city of Minneapolis for workers, whether they work in a local business, a larger business, or they're drivers or gig workers like you. So thank you so much for being here with that. I, I have my support for this um, ordinance and I would like to move this forward. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Councilmember Chowdhury. Um, final comment for um, main author of this ordinance, <laughs> Councilmember Robin Wansley. Thank you, Chair Osman, and again, just thank you to the dozens of drivers and supporters who spoke today um, in favor of this ordinance and recognizing um, the significant labor it took amongst um, both me, my co-authors, including Council Member Osmond and Council Member Chavez, in partnership with our drivers um, to be able to bring forward this legislation that does, as Council Member uh, Chowdhury said, gets us in alignment with our current and existing minimum wage policies. Um, as we heard today and have heard over the past several years, um, drivers are struggling to make ends meet in our city, and they are struggling because they are not earning minimum wage equivalents. And as a city, we have already taken the position that all workers should earn at least at least $15.57 an hour. And now our drivers are simply asking us to extend that protection to them. And I want to highlight it would make no sense that as a city, we should allow, once again, a multi-billion dollar, thank you, Councilmember Chaudhary, for reading those figures. Uh, we should not be allowing multi-billion dollar corporations to continue to be exempted uh, from paying the same wages as small and medium-sized businesses um, do and are clearly thriving under those uh, circumstances. And in many ways, as I remember one of the testifiers who was part of the uh, Fight for 15 uh, movement here in Minneapolis, um, in so many ways, it's, it's kind of the same experience. Um, at that time, we also heard from big business that implementing a $15 minimum wage would cause the sky to fall, a zombie apoc apocalypse would fall amongst the, the city. All things would just end. And thankfully, legislators at that time, some of which still are here on council, um, did not listen to those fear-mongering claims and instead decided to move forward with the $15 minimum wage and guaranteed that to everyone who works in Minneapolis. And now we have hundreds of small businesses in Minneapolis who pay the minimum wage and again thrive. So again, why would we pass a policy or any type of rates that would exempt a multi-billion dollar corporation from doing the very same thing? And also I wanna highlight um, something that both uh, Uber and Lyft have shared to council, at least to the co-authors repeatedly, they have shared that they are already paying the minimum wage. Both have stated this numerous times and for some reason yet, they are working hard to kill this ordinance. And I really cannot make it make sense. If these companies are already paying 15, if not more, an hour, this ordinance should make no difference to them once it's passed. And this is really then about corporate profits than guaranteeing minimum wage. And for a body, it should be an easy decision of where and who we choose. We should choose the people, we should choose our workers, we should choose the people who make the city thrive and they deserve a minimum wage. We also know that these corporations like to threaten to leave and we know that they are treating our workers unfairly. And I will also like to point out that a massive settlement recently took place in New York which resulted in Uber and Lyft paying out over $300 million to rideshare drivers due to them engaging in wage theft practices. 
We have the opportunity to prevent that from happening in Minneapolis, and this ordinance is the first step towards doing that. Because if we do not regulate them, guaranteed they will continue to exploit drivers, and we should not be standing for that as a city that said it is pro-workers, it is pro-working you know, working class people. So I really hope today in this committee and on March 7, we have an overwhelming post-majority vote um, to make sure that we are guaranteeing our drivers a minimum wage and nothing less. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, your comment, Councilmember Robin Wensley. Um, as I, I see no one else, I want again. I want to thank all the people that show up today, all the drivers, uh, the different groups, Mulda members, Mulda, and others who come together today to hold hand and stand behind um, and speak out. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, see no one else. Uh, and any further discussion with the council member uh, Chowdhury motion to move this item forward, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Council member Rainville. No. Cashman. Aye. Jenkins. Aye. Chowdhury. Aye. Vice Chair Ellison. Aye. Chair Osman. Aye. There are five ayes and one nay. Uh, that item is approved. Thank you so much. Um, uh, colleagues, we will take 10 minutes recess. We will re reconvene at 314. 314. Thank you so much.
Judy, the public hearings for the MIF. That's why we're having the public hearings for the MIF. Okay. The MIF and the business subsidy thing. Okay. Where'd all the cameras go? How are you doing? Good. I got a lot.
Jo. Tech minute. We are ready to recess or reconvene. One minute. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, welcome back. We are ready to go. Uh, Chair Osman, you may want to call the roll just to verify quorum after the recess. Yes, thank you. Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Rainville. Present. Cashman. Present. Jenkins. Chowdhury is absent. Ellison. Here. Osman. Present. There are five members present. Let the record reflect. We have a quorum. We will now take up to uh, for our uh, next item for our business. Um, next item is public hearing for grants and loans agreements for George Muller Innovation Solution LLC. Uh, before I ask staff to give us presentation, I would like to recognize uh, Director of CBET, Eric Hansen, to make a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I just wanted to bring some attention and context to the next um, agenda item in front of you today. And the essentially the last two years of work that the city has been doing to bring this uh, project to this very important milestone. Uh, today you'll hear staff talking about terms for a, for a loan that the council uh, uh, approved, um, funding that the council approved back in November of 2022. The funding was very critical to the city's ability to leverage um, state funding. And you'll hear the staff talk about $3 million in state Minnesota investment funds uh, that will come to this project mainly because the city was such an early adopter in this project. Mr. George and his team will be bringing a manufacturing facility to the north side in the near north neighborhood. He will own the property when this project is over. He will employ 160 people, all with household supporting wages, into this project. He will bring $30 million in investment with this project, and the production will be of housing. Um, I'm not, cannot be remiss in acknowledging that we're at the tail end of Black History Month, and this is a uh, black-owned business that we're helping um, catalyze, and so we have um, employment, economic investment uh, of a black-owned business in the North Side by a native North Sider. And so this is a very big milestone in this project, um, and I just want to give some context about how the city has been a leader in making sure that this project has moved forward, and I appreciate for the time. And uh, with that, um, Mr. Chair, we can have the staff, uh, Judy Moses, come up. Thank you so much, uh, Director Hansen, and um, I'd like to recognize we have been joined by Councilmember Chowdhury. Uh, staff, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Osman, members of the committee. I'm Judy Moses with CPED Business Development. Today I'm seeking approval of two items. The first is acceptance of a $3 million, $3 million in financial assistance from the state of Minnesota for the George Modular Innovation Solutions Project. And second is approval of the terms for a $2 million loan from the city, which was authorized by the city council in November of 2022. Per state statute, both items require a public hearing and a business subsidy agreement. The loans are to George Modular Innovation Solu Solutions, which plans to acquire and upfit a warehouse at 1400 Washington Avenue North into a manufacturing 
plant for modular housing units. This plant will produce modular units for multi-story apartment buildings. The project aims to close on the acquisition and of the property and begin preparing it for operations this spring. Devin George is the president of George Modular Innovation Solutions and the executive director of Building Blocks, Inc., which is a real estate company specializing in multifamily residential development and management. Building Blocks has completed affordable housing developments in Minneapolis. Building Blocks and Building Blocks Collective Trust and the George Group George Group North are all ent entities controlled by Devon George and will share ownership in the project. The initial order for the modular units built at the facility is for the Building Blocks Affordable Housing Project at the Upper Harbor site. The project is seeking financing from a range of sources, including the state and the city. In May of 2023, the City Council approved an application to the Minnesota Investment Fund Program, which is administered by the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. DEED has since awarded $3 million to the project to help fund the acquisition and production equipment. This funding will be a loan that encourages job creation. The staff report describes the details of the loan and the business subsidy. In short, the project plans to create 166 permanent full-time jobs paying a living wage within two years of opening. If the job goals are met, one million of the loan will be forgiven. The project is also receiving a loan from the city. In November 2022, the city council authorized a $2 million loan. The action today sets the terms for the city loan, which focuses on promoting job creation for Minneapolis residents. The staff report describes the details of the loan and the business subsidy. In short, the loan could be fully forgiven if the project meets its job goals and hires half of the employees from the city of Minneapolis. The business subsidy objective is the opening and operation of the manufacturing facility. So we're requesting um, three items, the acceptance of the $3 million award from the state, approval of the terms for the $2 million city loan, and authorization to execute all related documents. This completes my report, and I would be happy to answer questions. Um, and there are representatives from the company here as well. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm going to proceed to open the public hearing. And I have, I see uh, Devin George is here. I like to call him to speak. Yeah. Okay. I usually put the question on the last after the comment. Go ahead, sir. Yes. I'm here to thank you guys for this uh, journey that I've been on of helping me rebuild the north side neighborhood where I'm from. Um, real short, my dad still lives there, and, and the most popular question that he gets requested of people knocking on his door every day is, can your son give me a house or can he give me a job? I need a job from your son. Can you? And so that has been my task to help build the housing and provide jobs, which we've been doing. And this is a great uh, opportunity to target and uh, provide opportunities for this opportunity and for people in North Minneapolis that could get there uh, in this distance. And I want to thank, you know, Eric and CPED, the city of Minneapolis, all of you guys from your support in the past, um, the state of Minnesota, um, Senator Champion, the mayor, everybody has been on board with this uh, this plan to rebuild this neighborhood and to, re to provide this opportunity. So we thank you. Um, if there's any technical questions, we have our team here. Um, but I'll leave this up to Mr. English, and he'll say a few words. Thank you. Uh, Bill English. If I'm walking a little slow, my only advice to you is keep breathing. You will get there. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Os Osmond and uh, Council uh, Member Os Osmond, and to the rest of you, you know the respect I have for you. I have always been a partner to City of Minneapolis and CPAD. Um, but I must go back, and, and Derek told me he wasn't going to forget, but he did. 
how this project started. It started with the North Job Creation Team, where we did research with the University of Minnesota that told us this project could create 300 jobs and because modular housing was the way it was going to be built. My background in control data told me that years ago that we would be building food and, and houses 365 days a year in inclement weather. That turned out to be true then and is now even more true now. Modular is the way multifamily dwellings are going to be built and even single families are going to be built. Uh, I want to summarize this because I don't want to take up more time. My grandson accused me of never finding a mic that I don't fall in love with. <laughs> so, but I, I, I want to thank you all for this. I want to tell you what, it, what it's really doing. First of all, 165 jobs is just the first cut. It will end up being 300 jobs, according to Lou Lockwood, the CEO of, of George Modular Innovation Solutions who's built five plants around the nation and knows what he's doing. And we know that that it's going to be there. It's going to be 300 jobs. All, and the minimum wage is going to be $30 an hour. So we're going to talk about that over and over to our community. But I, 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 I want to express my support for CPED in particular and for the council members Ellison and Vitro for weighing in. Um, absolutely, Councilmember Rainville and Councilmember Jenkins have been strong supporters. So thank you for this opportunity. I'm looking forward to working with you at our celebration when we open this building and create these jobs and drive economic development to North Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Is there anyone else who would like to make comments on the public? Um, seeing no one else, I will close the public hearing and I will call Councilmember Jenkins for a question or comment. Thank you, um, Chair Osman. I, I guess I will start with a comment and just say how thrilled I am that this project is finally underway. I've been talking to uh, Mr. English and Mr. George for years now about this project and um, it's really great to see it come to uh, fruition, particularly as um, Director um, Eric stated, Hansen that um, it comes on the tail end of uh, Black History Month. And so, um, you know, we know that black businesses are struggling to to make it in in this community and all around the country and so it's great to see um this black business uh, thriving and being able to create housing and job opportunities for young people in north minneapolis um that said i was just trying to get clarity um from ms moses item number one under the um, um, the layout here says that we're accepting a grant of $3 million, and then it goes on to talk about a loan for $3 million. So I'm just not clear. Is it a grant or a loan? Chair Osmond, Council Member Jenkins, um, the state provides um, a grant agreement, which is between the deed and the city of Minneapolis, and we are required to abide by their um, um, terms to then provide a loan to the business, which has certain requirements um, to um, achieve, if they achieve um, the jobs goals and the spending goals, because they have to spend a certain amount of money on the project as well. If they reach those goals, then one million of the three would be a grant to the business, but they are required to pay back the other $2 million, but it is um, at a 0% interest rate. So the word. So it's a grant and a loan. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thanks for that clarification. Um, yeah, that was my question. 
Thank you, Councilmember Jenkins. Uh, Councilmember Rainville. Thank you, Chair Osmond. Uh, just very quickly, because I know we're pressed for time here, but uh, Mr. English and Mr. George, I'm so happy for you. I've, I've seen your determination in sticking with this, and I look forward to uh, being there when you cut the ribbon on that and when you break the ground. So I'll be looking for that in my inbox, okay? Uh, thank you. Uh, before I call Councilmember Ellison, I'd like to recognize... Uh, 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 Chair Osmond and, and Councilmember Jenkins, just to clarify, the, the state gives us the money, and then we have the responsibility to administer the loan. So okay. the grant is a nice thing for the state for us to then administer the loan on the behalf of the state. So that's why that's a grant and a loan. Thank you, Senator. Yep. Councilmember Ellison? Uh, thank you, Chair Osmond. And I, I really can't uh, uh, praise this team, Devin George, Bill English, all of you, uh, any better than my colleague, uh, uh, Councilmember Jenkins, did. Uh, you know, I, I echo all of those sentiments. Um, and, um, and, you know, this is an innovative solution to a problem that, to several problems that we see that we face on the north side and in, and, and in our city as a whole. Let's be, let's be honest. You know, there's a housing, short, housing shortage all across the country. You know, Minneapolis is no exception from that. Um, and, and this offers us an innovative solution about how to meet that need while also offering, uh, you know, uh, jobs starting at $30 an hour. That's, that's, that's incredible. Uh, all while being uh, on the north side of Minneapolis, that's really incredible work. Um, you know, we've got a, lot, a long way to go in order to, you know, sort of meet the need of what a lot of folks will refer to as the housing continuum, right? And so, uh, I, uh, you know, it, it's not lost on me that just down the street is a different type of innovative project with the Vivo Villages um, in helping people get, in, you know, off the street. This is going to build the kind of homes that people can make their life in. Uh, and so, uh, and so I, I really appreciate um, this work. It's, it's a tool that is not only going to serve North Minneapolis, but it's going to be a way that North Minneapolis can serve the rest of the, of the, of the region, the rest of the metro, quite frankly. Um, and so with that, um, and with a lot of gratitude uh, uh, you know, to, to our partners here, uh, I am happy to move approval of this item, and I hope my colleagues will join me in uh, supporting it. Uh, thank you so much, Councilmember Ellison, and again, um, great work, and thank you for your commitment, and great uh, job for the staff for really working on this. It's great to see black-owned uh, businesses or, uh, that are thriving and, um, you know, uh, bringing jobs and housing to our communities. Super happy and super excited. With that, I see no one else with the motion of uh, Allison, uh, Councilmember Allison to move Approval for this item, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and the item has been approved. Thank you. All right, our next item is a National Park Service grant related to the African American Historic and Cultural Content Study. I will invite uh, Eric, uh, I'm sorry, Aaron Kay to give us presentation. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair Osmond and committee members. My name is Erin Kay, and I am a senior city planner in the Historic Preservation subsection of the Department of Community Planning and Economic Development, or CPED. I'm here today to present on a National Park Service, or NPS, grant that CPED has received for documentation related to a Minneapolis African American historic and cultural context study. We request that the council accept the grant from the NPS in the amount of $75,000 authorize an agreement with NPS for the grant, and pass a resolution approving the appropriation of funds to CPED. This is a highly competitive federal grant that we are honored to have been awarded. I'll present some brief information about the project background and its impact, what this grant will specifically fund, and our efforts to engage the community in this project. Four years ago, CPED received a $50,000 grant from the National Trust for Historic Preservation's African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. This grant was awarded to conduct community engagement and draft an outline for a future context study. A context study is a document that describes people, places, and events related to a common theme. Judge Lejeune Lang led the consultant team for this project, and I was a part of that team before I joined CPED in 2022. We planned six virtual engagement meetings on different themes related to African American history. We engaged with about 120 people, conducted research, and then also recorded several oral history interviews. We drafted a robust outline to guide this next stage of work. 
Fast forward to December 2023, and CPED was awarded a $67,500 legacy grant from the Minnesota Historical Society to fund the context study and an architectural history survey. Council accepted this award earlier this month, and we are moving forward to hire a consultant. This will be the first context of its kind for Minneapolis, and it will help document the history of African Americans in Minneapolis and fill a significant gap in the city's knowledge. As we've already acknowledged today, it is the tail end of Black History Month, so it's fitting to share this news with you now and also have this way to continue to recognize and honor Black history throughout the year. When we applied for the Legacy Grant last summer, we also applied to the National Park Service's Underrepresented Communities Grant URC program with the hope that we would get one of the grants to do the project. The URC program works towards diversifying the properties nominated to the National Register of Historic Places, which is the country's official list of places important to our history. We learned earlier this month that CPED was also awarded a URC grant in the amount of $75,000, and this is the grant before you today. We will use this grant to expand the scope of work and extend the project into 2026. So after the context study is complete, we will hire a consultant to prepare what's called a multiple property documentation form, or MPDF. And this will give us a framework for evaluating and listing properties in the National Register. We will also prepare nominations for three properties in Minneapolis associated with African American history to the National Register with the property owner's consent. And this would be an honorary designation and a way to recognize formally um, the history and contributions of members of our community. Throughout the project, we have recognized the importance of working with and communicating with the community. Since the first phase was completed, we have sent communications to the mayor and also council members to share with your wards. We presented at the 2022 Preserve Minnesota Statewide Historic Preservation Conference and plan to propose another session at this fall's preservation conference. We attended a Northside Residence Redevelopment Council meeting and they expressed interest in continuing to participate in the project. We also promoted the, booth at, or the project at our booth at the 2023 Community Connections Conference and I imagine we'll be back there next year. And the work will continue through this next phase by sharing information on our project website and social media and with you all for your newsletters. We also plan to attend community events and continue to engage with folks as opportunities arise. This concludes my presentation and I'm happy to stay for questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. Are there any questions or discussion for this item? Councilmember uh, Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Osman um, and Ms. Q. K. Ms. K, thank you so much for your presentation and for your work on this project throughout the years. Um, and, um, you know, Judge Lane is a, a proud Ward 8 constituent, and we're very proud to have her and been working with her on a number of um, historic preservation projects over the years, including the um, Fire Station um, in South Minneapolis and in other locations. I'm curious if this grant, I mean, seeing as how we have been able to get a succession of grants, the state, federal grants, et cetera, does that bode well for actually bringing some of these projects into fruition with further grants in your estimation? Chair Osman, Councilmember Jenkins, thanks for that question. Um, Andrea Burke and I attended a kickoff meeting for the, this National Park Service grant last week and we learned that the National Park Service encourages repeat applicants. Okay. And so now that we have been a first time recipient of this grant and through the, the development of this multiple property documentation form, that will make it hopefully even easier for us to continue to nominate properties to the National Register if property owners are interested and the community is interested in recognizing that history. Um, and it's certainly possible to go back for additional funds. Another recipient, the New York City LGBT Sites Project, they're on their seventh round of getting grant funding um, from At this the same vehicle. Stonewall uh, Memorial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, to that end, I mean, I'm just going to put in a plug for uh, the George Floyd Square, George Floyd Memorial, sort of George Floyd area. There's been a lot of talk about um, 
how do we create um, or generate attention from the National Park Service around um, that area. And um, so hopefully that will enter into you guys' uh, evaluations of important sites. Um, and then you mentioned that there there would be three um, projects. Have, have those been identified as such or... Chair Osman, Council Member Jenkins, are you asking about the the three properties for the National Register nominations? Yes. So we have not yet identified those. Um, over the next year, while we do the first phase of work here with the context study, we'll have our consultant do an architectural history survey to identify 25 possible properties mm-hmm. um, that could be the one, the three that are listed in the National Register. Um, and we hope to do that with feedback from the community, of course, in conversation with the property owners, if that's even something they want to pursue. And then from there, um, we'll identify three to move forward for nomination at this point. Um, and then depending on interest, there may be possibility then that we could apply for future grants to do future nominations of properties. And, and you're thinking they would be physical properties and buildings? Sure, that's a good question. So um, let's see, a property is defined as a building, an, a structure, an object, a site, or a district. So it is possible that a landscape could um, be nominated. There are bridges that are on the National Register. Mm-hmm. There are statues on the National Register. So um, it's most likely that it would be a building, but it certainly doesn't have to be. Thank you so much. Councilmember Ellison. <laughs> Sorry, did not mean to have my uh, tag up, uh, but uh, but just tremendous work. And uh, no, I didn't intend to, to make a comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, see no further question. I will approve uh, this item. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. And those opposed, say nay. This item is approved. And now our next item, our last item, uh, is our 4D affordable housing. Uh, I'll invite David uh, Mukunza to give us a presentation, and thank you and Amy for being uh, patient with us today. So good afternoon, Council Chair Osman and committee members and committee members. I am David Mukunza with Residential Finance, CPED's Residential Finance. I am here to share some proposed changes to the city's 4D affordable housing incentive program. As a background, uh, the 4D program started in 2018 as part of our naturally occurring affordable housing programs in the preservation and sustainability of affordable housing and prevention of displacement of tenants. The program provides a reduction in property taxes in exchange for property owners uh, reserving at least 20% of those units at or below 60% area medium income. Over 2,400 units have been enrolled since program inception. The benefits for participating in this program are property tax reductions, energy efficiency, and solar installation through the city's health department, the Green Cost Share Fund. So staff is proposing updates to accommodate changes made by the legislature in 2023, and I will delve into the three proposed changes. So under the previous arrangement, uh, there were property tax savings up to 40%. This will now increase to a property tax savings of up to 80% due to lowering of the tax class rate. Under the previous arrangement, there was a two-tier classification rate with the first 100,000 of market value of a property for tax purposes. That was, uh, they used a 0.75 class rate to calculate and the remainder was done at 025 The new changes have proposed a uniform class rate of 0.25. Under the third change, there was no guidance given 
to how those savings, property tax savings, are going to be expended. Under the new changes, uh, property tax savings must be used broadly for improving the condition of the property under eligible uses. The pro eligible uses are property maintenance, property security, and increases to the property reserve account. Staff is also proposing several changes to the compliance requirements for the program. We propose to eliminate the 500 fine for non-compliant unit and instead have the loss of reduced tax rate being the penalty for program non-compliance. This is aligned with the other 4D cities uh, like St. Paul, Edina, St. Louis Park and Golden Valley and other Minneapolis programs. In addition, owners of non-compliant units will not be allowed to enroll into the program until they return those units into compliance. So the last slide, I just want to share um, uh, uh, one of our buildings. It's an 11-unit building uh, in Humboldt Avenue South, which is currently enrolled in the 4D program. And this is a clear example of the benefits that can be derived in participating in this program. So in this uh, example that I'm sharing, um, the owner was able to receive 90% of green cost share savings uh, towards installation of a new boiler, a water heater, and installation of exterior sidewalls. That concludes my presentation, and I will be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, David, for your presentation. Are there any questions? Councilmember Cashman. Thank you so much for the presentation. These changes make a lot of sense. Um, instead of the fine you know, for noncompliance to just make sure that they can't enroll new properties until they're in compliance, it makes a lot of sense. So really happy about these changes. Hoping that we can have even more people enrolling in this program. I know there's a lot of naturally occurring affordable housing in the city that needs these upgrades, that needs energy upgrades, maintenance upgrades, um, and that serves all of our residents and their housing stock better. Um, I did want to ask if you can define naturally occurring affordable housing because I wonder how that compares to other types of affordable housing. So Council Chair Osman, uh, Council Member Cashman, um, so naturally occurring affordable housing is um, uh, a building with rents uh, that are quite low uh, comparative to market rents, uh, mm -hmm. current market rents, uh, without receiving any public subsidy. Okay, so this is not considered to be a public subsidy then? So this won't be a public subsidy, yeah. Okay, what, what's the difference between this property tax and uh, decrease and a public subsidy? So, uh, Council... Chair Osman and mm -hmm. Council Member uh, Cashman. Um, so the difference is just the reductions in those tax savings mm -hmm. uh, because there are a different number of rental properties that are classified differently. Mm -hmm. um, so you could actually arguably argue it's a public subsidy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm only asking so I can explain to property managers in my ward how they can enroll and if they qualify. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Kashman, Councilmember Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Osman. Um, I'm just curious, um, how how do we ensure that uh, tax savings are being used for the uh, qualified expenses? You, I think you named. Um, exterior repairs, um, energy investments, etc. But how how would that be sort of regulated? Yeah, uh, Council Chair Osman, uh, Council Member Jenkins, uh, that's a great question. Um, so under the new legislative changes, uh, they will require property owners to actually self-certify uh, on an annual basis. So they would be able to list um, those savings, how much money of those tax savings have they gone to, say, property maintenance, or how much of those savings have gone to property security. But overall, it's improvement of the property of those affordable homes 
for the tenants that will be occupying them. So how do, how do you determine the actual savings then? Um, or who determines the savings, I guess I should say. So, so it's, so council member, council chair Osman and council member Jenkins. So who determines those savings? That's uh, actually the, um, the property owners. Uh, the property owners are the ones who are actually able to see uh, those savings against the operating expenses that I, they're incurring on those properties uh, on an annual basis. Yeah, I, I guess, so you're, I don't get to determine what my property tax is, mm -hmm. right? And so some outside body is determining what my property tax is. So I, I guess I just don't understand how then the savings so, is so determined. If I may help you understand. So um, once they register for the 4D program, um, then the Minnesota Housing will be able to certify those properties as 4D. And by doing that, that's how they'll be able to get a lower tax rate savings. Okay, and then some number will be supplied to the owner to say, this is what you saved. So, so once, once it has been certified by Minnesota Housing, that would will, that will then be communicated back to the city assessor. The city assessor will be able to calculate how much those tax savings will be, and then Hennepin County will be able to send a tax bill to the uh, respective property owner. Okay. Mm -hmm. Amy. Hi. Good afternoon, Council Members. Um, Chair Osman, Council Member Jenkins. I'm Amy Geisler. I'm the manager of the residential finance team. Work with David on the 4D program. Mm -hmm. um, so, as David mentioned, uh, there is a self certification process. You know, so once, once a property enrolls in the program and they receive the benefit of this reduced property tax, um, they're in a lower property tax classification going forward. So, they'll know what their savings are. Um, and then um, when they submit their self-certification to Minnesota Housing, they'll have to attest, and it will be a legal document of some sort, like an affidavit. Well, they'll document the savings that they received from a previous tax year, and then they'll explain how they spent those expenses, um, all those on the eligible uses that the state requires with their new language. Okay, so essentially it's the responsibility is the property owners. Correct, yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Um, seeing uh, no one else, uh, I will move this approval, this item for approval. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. This item is approved. Uh, seeing no further business before us, with no objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned.